Okay, so hi everybody. This is a, a bit of a change of pace, I think, definitely from the last talk and maybe from other talks that you're used to seeing in this, um, in this series. Um, but I think, um, and I'm here really to talk about what I think is kind of a, a neat opportunity um, and really to address some of the challenges that I've had in trying to carry out this work uh, in the hopes that we can get more minds thinking about it so that we can try to facilitate this type of thing. So I'm going to be um, talking about this in the context of autism, but that is really just as a case study. This is just the context for this particular talk. But everything that I'm going to be talking about is, um, is re can really be extended to other projects, and I'll give a couple of examples at the end. Um, so as a disclaimer, I'm, a, I'm an epidemiologist. Maybe that's not a disclaimer, but that makes me a little bit different in terms of skill set from a lot of you. And I'm actually primarily a breast cancer researcher. Um, and so you might say, okay, so what's going on with the autism thing? But I think um, one of the part of it is opportunity. Part of it is seeing that this type of work can be extended to, uh, I'm already working to apply it in the area of breast cancer. Um, and some of it is using the fact that I am an epidemiologist that um, uses methods that can be applied to lots of different things and uh, our interests can evolve over time. So anyway, um, I'm just going to provide with you a little bit of context so you can understand the framework for the particular sort of setting that I'm going to be discussing this type of project. So I'm sure you're familiar with the idea of um, autism spectrum disorder. It's a collection of lifelong neural developmental disorders that um, are very, have very complex phenotypes and are very heterogeneous. There are a certain set of core autism symptoms, which is probably the type of thing that you are familiar with, um, related to impaired communication and social interactions, repetitive behaviors, some sensory processing issues, um, and that type of thing. Um, but these symptoms, these core symptoms, can range in severity, which is where we get the concept of autism as a spectrum phenotype. And along with the, these core symptoms come a range of comorbidities that um, are frequently co-occur, so other conditions that co-occur with autism. And these could be other neural developmental disorders, so there's a, a, a lot of overlap in some of the sort of clinical domains that comprise an autism diagnosis that overlap with, say, ADHD or OCD or intellectual disability, um, anxiety. Um, and then at the same time, these kids also have um, an increased incidence of things like other psychiatric conditions like schizophrenia, but also other chronic conditions, things like asthma, um, epilepsy, sleep disorders, um, GI issues, and the like. So this all sort of really contributes to the complex nature of a diagnosis of autism and what this looks like from uh, a diagnostic trajectory perspective and what is going to happen for these kids in the future. Now, genetics are known to play a very important role in autism. It's highly heritable. Um, and this, uh, the genetics, just like the condition itself, is the genetics of this is also very heterogeneous. So there are contributions from both rare and common variants, um, but there's also significant component of de novo mutations, um, a, a lot of CNVs. Um, and then there's also heterogeneity within families. So you can have siblings from the same family who are both affected, but they carry different putative functional, putative variants associated with their autism. So, um, and it has, there's more work now that is showing that some of this genetic heterogeneity contributes to different <coughs> diagnostic trajectories and different patterns of comorbidity. So some of this phenotypic heterogeneity that we see. So genetics are playing a part in that. But the overall, both clinicians and parents have a hard time understanding what the long-term impact of both an autism diagnosis and carrying specific genetic variants um, is and what, what this information means. And so if we're going to be using uh, uh, genetic testing, in particular, I'm talking about whole genome sequencing clinically, we need to be able to tell parents in particular what the impact of these variants are um, and, and so this is sort of where this work is coming from. Okay, so the objective of the study was to bring together three different uh, data sources, a clinical data set, a genomic data set, uh, to, and link it with administrative health data, um, Ontario administrative health data. And what we decided that we wanted to do is to 
based on, you know, building on this idea that we have this heterogeneity uh, in phenotype and in the genetic component, that we would try to identify distinct subgroups of autism with unique health system trajectories um, and then characterize these based on their clinical phenotype and their genetics. So that was sort of what the objective of the project is. The objective of this talk is to discuss our approach to addressing the challenges that we've encountered along the way, um, how we have uh, addressed some of them already and how we propose to address those that remain, um, with the idea that um, we can sort of start laying the groundwork for this to be easier for people to do this type of work um, in other areas uh, in the future. Okay, so here we are. We're bringing together these three data sources. And in this case, we're using data from the Province of Ontario Neural Developmental Network, so the PON study. That is the source of the clinical, um, the clinical data. It's also the source of the genomic data, but all of the, all of the sequencing was done at the Center for Applied Genomics, so that's where that data is. And then we have the administrative health data at the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences, or ICES. So, first, the, the PON study. So, this is a multi center cross sectional study um, where this, these are the most recent numbers, I think, as of January, where a little over 2,600 children and youth between the ages of 1 and 21 years have been recruited. Um, you know, most of them are, uh, have a di primary diagnosis of autism or ADHD. Uh, recruitment started in 2012. 2012, uh, the first round ended in 2018, and we were renewed to then continue recruitment starting this year through to 2024. And patients are recruited across six, six different recruitment centers in Ontario, including in Toronto, both SickKids and Hull and Bloorview. So this is uh, a slide that sort of sums up on one side what the PON study is, which is actually a really rich data source. So this is a highly phenotyped group of young people. So they come in and they have uh, the very first platform there you can see is behavior and cognition. So here the thing I want to let you know is that there is cross-diagnosis phenotyping. So they... You might have come into the study because you have a primary diagnosis of autism, but you are given all of the testing, all of the standardized sort of clinical testing for autism, ADHD, OCD, they do IQ tests, uh, they test for anxiety, and so on and so on. So there's this extensive cross-disorder phenotyping that happens. They are also all provide uh, a DNA sample, and they eventually, well, they were supposed to all have brain MRIs, um, but um, there was some funding cuts, and so you know how that goes. But we're, that is still, many of them um, are going to be getting MRIs as well. And all of this is linked to a clinical trials network. There are mouse models and cell lines, and it's a really quite an extensive, really well-integrated um, project. So for this, this, like, part, this particular study, we accessed the data in July 2017, so um, there were about just over 2,200 kids that had been enrolled in that study at this time, and of that, 667 had consented to linkage using their Ontario health card numbers. So besides all of this other stuff that they consented for, the imaging and the DNA and the sequencing, all of this stuff, they also consented to, for linkage to administrative health data. So we're only talking about a subset of this group. When we actually did the linkage, so actually linked the data, so the PON study data has already been linked at um, ICES, 664 were successfully linked, and of those, just over 400 um, had a primary diagnosis of autism. Okay, so then along with this, the clinical data and the, high, you know, the phenotype data, we have all of the whole genome sequencing data. And right now, there are about 324 of the 417 kids with autism and consent to linkage through health card numbers who have um, whole genome sequencing data available. I put the greater than sign because obviously this is, some, this is still ongoing, so I might end up with a few more by the time this is done. Most have been sequenced on the high seek, and they're in the middle of being recalled right now to the new build, so that we're on a bit of a pause um, and this should be done May or June. Um, I put 
June, I tend to err on the side of things taking more time. But Okay, and then the final piece, which is likely the piece, um, I don't know for sure, but likely the piece that you're not as familiar with, is the data that's available at ICES. And so this is really a, um, a core data repository of Ontario health data where um, that is coded and linkable across individuals. And it includes basically uh, information about anytime anybody with an Ontario healthcare number interacts with the healthcare system. So you go see your doctor, you see a specialist, you go to the emergency department, you have a surgery, you, um, you know, whatever it is, you have home care, you have, uh, um, so there's all of these different sort of points of interaction with the healthcare system. They've got that information at the individual level. Um, and on top of that, they have some of these special collections. So things like the Ontario Cancer Registry is there, uh, the Ontario Breast Screening Program data is linked there. Um, there's uh, HIV clinic data that's linked there and so on. And then there are, there's this derived chronic condition column here in the red. And this, um, and this is uh, where they have developed algorithms using the administrative data to identify individuals with certain conditions. So this is where you can get some information on comorbid conditions. And then the final piece is that all of this can end up being linked with your project specific research data, right? So in this case, we're talking about the pond study data. So this is what it ends up looking like once it's all come together and the, all the data sharing agreements and all the stuff is basically mostly what I do. You should take a class on it when you do your PhD on how to do data sharing agreements and the like, but it is all coming together. So everything except the, the sequencing data is at ICES and linked. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're waiting for the, the sequencing data to be called. So as we've moved through this project, um, I started thinking about what I wanted other people to be thinking about too, to try to help us figure out how to do this and to also put a little bit of pressure on people to try to move this type of work forward. Um, and um, I sort of came up with three main themes. Uh, there were um, opportunities around understanding the types of research questions that we can answer by doing this type of linkage, um, focusing on those that could really fill in a clinical gap. There were those related to privacy, data access, and consent, which unfortunately I spent quite a lot of time on, uh, and those related to infrastructure and expertise. So if we start thinking about a feasible, but also a relevant, clinically relevant study um, question that we could address by doing this, what, we're really, what I really came up with is that we're providing context. So we're taking a cross-sectional study, right, that is a snapshot of kids, highly phenotype, we have sequencing data, and when we link it with the administrative health data, we then have a lifetime of interactions with the healthcare system, both looking back in time and prospectively. So we have been able to turn this cross-sectional study into something that it can have both retrospective and prospective implications. So in doing so, we had to bring together these three sort of areas of research. We have these clinical type research, genomics, and we have this health services research people who typically deal just with the administrative data. And in this, there is inherent differences in the depth and the breadth of the type of data. So when we think of clinical studies or genomic data, we typically have a lot of information about a smaller number of people, right? And with administrative data, we have very high level data on a large number of people. And this is where you think about POND. So if we have POND as being the Empire State Building where we have this highly phenotyped, relatively small group. And then we're then able to link it looking forward in time and back in time and really sort of taking advantage of the fact that we have um, these different sort of uh, sources of data, allowing them to complement each other. So I started thinking about what are all the different sort of things we can do. If like, this is just a project specific linkage, but if we think about what we could do if we really accomplished population level linkage of genomic data, that that was something that we could do, it seems that there's a lot that we could, could be gained from that. There's the potential for the identification of novel phenotypic associations. So there could be genetic variants that are associated with a particular subtype of autism that often co-occurs with epilepsy. But that is, that's that thing. And that may not be readily ev evident when you're looking um, just within a cohort of, 
of autism and or if you don't have especially if you don't have all of that phenotype data so this could then lead to um, clues about the underlying biology, identify new targets for intervention, treatment, and prevention. I think the point in autism, I think about intervention, if you can identify early that this is going to be someone who, yes, has autism, but uh, is like more likely to develop schizophrenia later in life, then there's an intervention or there is preparation um, that, can be, that can be made ahead of time. So there are places here where you can plan for care and you can plan for health system use as well. And then, but what I sort of was focusing on is very, the idea that we could identify genetic changes that are associated with specific diagnostic trajectories and then trying to understand the long-term impact of carrying a specific variant, right? So a kid goes and has their, you know, a parent takes their child and their genome is sequenced, and then they are given a whole bunch of information back, and they are told that they have some de novo copy number variant that we think might be important, but we're not really sure how. We think this is what is related to your autism, but what does that actually mean for that kid in the long term? That's sort of the thing that a parent is thinking about, I think, in that situation. So this is sort of what I decided to focus on, and this is what I think it could look like. So here we have... The, the green dashed line is sort of representing the PON data being this cross-sectional study where we have the whole genome sequencing data, we have the phenotype data, and we link it at this point, at this one point in time with the administrative data. What we're then able to do is look back and say, okay, so patient A, at four months, they were having feeding trouble, so they were referred to a GI or they were referred to an immunologist to test for food allergies, Right? That no one's thinking autism or anything at this point. They're just worried because the kid's not feeding well. The next thing that happens is that they're not developing language, so they're worried that maybe they're, there's something wrong with their hearing, so they get sent to ENT. Maybe they have fluid, they need tubes, whatever. Um, and this starts off this diagnostic trajectory, right? It, that starts actually with a GI referral, but ultimately ends up with a diagnosis of autism, say, at age two in that case. Then you could have another situation where perhaps you have a more high functioning autistic kid who doesn't actually get picked up until they start school. Social pressures become more challenging. Um, and so you have a referral to a pediatrician at age four and then that is sort of what starts that diagnosis. So you can see how, um, how in doing this type of linkage, you can provide context for the impact of a specific variant that could actually lead to interventions earlier on, especially for patient A, where it might be needed. Um, and then I didn't bother to put in, these kids have very complex histories. So the fact that I put one ED visit and one psychiatric, psychiatrist referral there is not really what this picture looks like. These guys have a lot of interactions with the healthcare system. So there's quite a lot of data to work with. So I think where it can help is to inform sort of this really fast changing knowledge base, right? We are sequencing with the cost is coming down. It takes us less time to do it. There's a tremendous amount of information out there. And we, it, it is sort of now it, the test is to figure out how to classify these variants and how to communicate their clinical significance in a really practical level. That's what a parent wants. And that's what a clinician wants to be able to say to the parent when they've um, done the sequencing. So as sequencing becomes increasingly rec recommended for kids with developmental concerns, it's not the standard yet. First, we, if microarray is first, and then possibly um, if, if nothing is found then, then we'll do like a targeted sequencing. But more and more, they're pushing for whole genome sequencing. And really, we need to be able to try to provide more information about the impact of these variants. So what we proposed to do for this project, as I mentioned, was to try to identify subgroups of autism with unique diagnostic trajectories. So we would use the health system interaction information, things related to um, doctor's visits, referrals to specialists, hospitals, surgeries, um, the points of entry. So what was their first referral? Was the first referral to a GI or, or, or to an ENT? Um, and the age of that first referral, as well as comorbid conditions, so psychiatric conditions, chronic conditions, and stuff, and, and then characterize those subgroups based on 
demographics, this cross disorder phenotyping that's available in POND, and the genetic data. Now, this, um, I'll talk more about specifically how we're trying to use the genetic data um, and why it's down in this area rather than up in the subgroup, uh, determining the subgroup uh, area. And part of that is very directly linked to the challenges we've had related to privacy, data access, and consent. So ICS is a prescribed entity under the Ontario government legislation. So what this means is that they are allowed to compile statistics and conduct analysis that tell us about patient management and about how well the healthcare system is working. Right? So that's their mandate as a, um, as a um, prescribed entity. Now, what this means is that they have patient level records that are, that are linkable across all of these different uh, sources of healthcare information. Um, and this is all done through a unique identifier. So it, it is linked to your health card number, but then there is a second identifier, um, an IKN, that is used for the actual linkage. And once the data is linked, uh, only um, summary data is shared outside of the ICS environment, ICES environment, excuse me. Um, so, you know, as uh, if I'm working on my particular project and I have my research team, even I, when I'm looking at frequency tables from results, can only see, I will see a, like a less than or equal to five and in cells where um, there are less than six um, counts. So there are, you know, they're suppressing small cells and I'm only really seeing frequencies, right? And any time I present any, I had to tell them, I had to be sure, I had to tell them today that I was going to be giving a talk and that I was not going to be presenting any frequencies that had... Uh, uh, less than um, less than six counts per cell. So this, uh, as you might think, if you think about how we use whole genome sequencing data and how we think it might be, um, you know, useful in determining, uh, you know, functional variants, uh, is a bit of a problem because we typically talk about rare variants, and if um, some of these could be private, especially in a smaller study population like in pod. Now, in contrast to this, we have what's happening in genomics, which is pretty much the exact opposite, right? We, we, so ICES works in a very controlled environment, and in genomics, there's more and more about bringing together, pooling. We need to be, you know, the, um, there are 13 countries in the EU who have committed to bringing whole genome sequencing data together. I think they're going to have 1 million by 2022. Um, there's UK Biobank there, um, and uh, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health is working really hard to create standards for sharing of this data. Um, and then there's, of course, Missings, which is um, Missing is a Google Sick Kids and Autism Speaks partnership project where they're trying to sequence um, at least 10,000 whole genomes of families of kids with autism, so trios as well and siblings as well. And this data is made freely available. I mean, you have to apply to access it, so it's a controlled access. But it's there, and it's meant for people to analyze, which is a little bit different from this idea of, um, you know, everything is sort of behind a, behind a wall when the data that's at ICES. So with this contrast in mind, and I started having initial meetings with people at ICES about doing this, at first they were very enthusiastic, and then um, suddenly in a meeting, uh, of course, many meetings into it, and the one we were having at the Center for Applied Genomics with all of them, uh, it came up the idea that the risk of re-identification, and that this was a big concern for them. So I don't know if many of you remember, but in 2013 there was a paper that was published where um, they were using publicly available like genealogy data. Um, investigators were able to identify people by tracking surnames with Y chromosomes. And this basically, I was at Memorial Sloan Kettering at the time, and I remember that all research just paused for a moment, but everybody just stopped to figure out what that meant. Um, and slowly everything got back to normal, um, because it was sort of recognized that, yes, an individual sequence is unique, but it's not trivial. It's not an, it's, it's not an easy thing to go and identify the sequence. But the media did um, 
actually most of the articles that I found about this were from Wired, they, and they were still talking about it in 2016. But anyway, um, so what they're concerned about is this idea of a unique uh, sequence for an individual, right? Um, and then even beyond that, that um, an individual's genetic sequence also tells, them, tells us something about their family. So this has implications related to consent. So of course, the PON study participants have consented explicitly to whole genome sequencing and linkage, but their family members did not. Um, implicit in this is that th these are parents who are giving consent for their children, so it's a little bit different. But if you think about applying this on a larger scale, um, the issue of consent becomes quite complicated because there will be information about people who did not really have any hand in determining what was there. Um, and the other issue is sort of what I alluded to before and how they deal with these smart, small cells and suppressing small cells is that many disease-causing variants are rare. Um, and particularly if I'm talking about a sample size of 500, most will be, many will be private. You know? And so that becomes an issue in terms of how well we're going to be able to use the sequencing data in this. My sense, though, is that really this is an issue of just unfamiliar data sources. So this is a new thing for them. We're talking about administrative health data that includes people's names, date of birth, sex, postal code, diagnoses, their doctor's visits, um, and, and they are more concerned about someone's genetic sequence. It seems to me that this is the risk of identification is much more likely using the administrative data than the genomic data. Um, and so really, it's just one of those things where um, they have to get used to the idea and realize that they can fold it into the measures that they have already have in place. So they recognize that there is risk associated with this, so they have things in place. We use non-disclosure agreements, data sharing agreements, and there is very controlled access and use, right? So, and you know, even like the UK Biobank does this too. You apply for a specific project. You can't just go, like, get the data and then go all willy-nilly and do whatever you want. It's the same thing with an ICES project. You have an analytic plan that is in place, including the shell tables that you plan to fill in um, before you even start your analysis. And that is what you are allowed to do with the data. And so there are ways to just apply the same principle, but incorporating the sequencing data as well. So the next one um, is, is perhaps a, the most challenging because, you know, um, it requires some rather large efforts by, by groups of people, but some of them are on the way. So both types of data and using them appropriately requires specialized knowledge, right? Administrative health data is its own beast, and there are things about it that, um, you know, that you can't, it's hard to just jump in and analyze it. And the same is true for genomic data, right? It, you need to understand how, how, how the data relates to each other, what it's telling you, what it means, what's important. Um, and... And, and so I think that um, this is sort of getting the people together who know about both types of things together in the same room is sort of the first step, which is kind of why I'm here, is trying to get people to think about how we can actually do this. Now, the other issue is that these groups of people who work with this data work in very different work environments. So genetic analyses, they, you know, use open source programming, you use um, resources and databases, publicly available things that are always being updated and you bring it together. It's a very dynamic, uh, constantly changing process, right? An annotation pipeline, uh, one month, you look at four months later, it's going to be a different thing. Everything is, information is constantly being updated. Whereas, um, oh, we're going to die. Um, so whereas um, administrative health data is analyzed within this controlled access environment, and even for me to try to get something like Plink, which I think about Plink has been around for a pretty long time, it's very well documented, that they have to do a whole use case, risk assessment, what's going to happen, they're concerned about having open source programming in their environment. Um, and they're becoming more open to it, which is... Um, which is good, because I'm not the only one asking for this type of thing. Um, but this is where you can see there's sort of a tension between just the way that these different groups of people work um, in their environment. And then the other issue, of course, is related to the size of the data and the processing power that's required to do that. So we're talking about all provincial health data 
and then um, the all the sequencing data on top of it. So as we work to do this, um, so I have engaged a multidisciplinary team of investigators, and we are working to address the privacy concerns of ICES and. You know, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health has laid out a framework for sharing of this data, and it really reflects very well the principles that are already in place to protect the administrative health data. So I think those two things really align. Um, but it also involves establishing new relationships. So ICES now has a, high, has a place in, the, in HPC for Health. I think the first project is going to run uh, next week, the first week of March. So... Um, the analysis that incorporates the full sequence will be possible soon. But in the meantime, I've sort of proposed a phased approach, um, which really reduces the data in the way that I'm using it, but will allow me to move forward with some analysis as I wait. So the first um, sort of step is really just doing a, looking at the burden of variants within autism genes, so focusing on 288 genes that have, have pretty good evidence of being implicated in autism and looking at burden of variants who are, that have been determined to be likely pathogenic. And this can just be a nice little indicator variable that, uh, because I'm not analyzing the data, right? I have an analyst at ICES. I, you, so I have to be able to tell her, okay, here, these are just 0, 1, 288 01 variables. Then the next step is I'm going uh, she is going to run SCAT, which I can try to do a gene level analysis. So we will still focus on just the 288 genes. We'll look at the sequence across those 288 genes and conduct a gene level analysis. And right now, so that's what this dotted line, that's where we are right now. Uh, in terms of step three, ICES will take the VCF files and the annotation files, but it will stay on their admin side. It will not be moved on to their analytic side until they're comfortable with this um, privacy piece. So that's the part that we're sort of working on. Because then it, once the HIDAP or the ISIS HPC for Health uh, environment is up and running, which should be next week, then this data can be moved into there and we can actually start using it to its full potential, I think. Because right now this is very reductive. <laughs> this is very, um... so anyway. And ultimately, we'd like to get the whole thing there um, eventually, but that um, right now seems a little, a little far away. So I think um, the take home here is that I think that there's a real opportunity here to get some understanding of the real sort of impact of, carrying, of, of genetic variants and, and an autism diagnosis specifically to this project. Um, and all parties are motivated to make it work. So I think that that is really promising. Um, it just feels it's very incremental at this point. Um, I will say that there are other projects that we're doing um, this type of work with. Um, so I'm involved in the perspective study, which is, this is more targeted sequencing in breast cancer used to construct polygenic risk scores for risk prediction and um, risk stratified screening. But we're going to be linking all of that data to the ICES data to look at outcomes for that too, following up um, to get information on cancer diagnoses and, um, and other comorbidities and so on. So there is opportunity here. The Ontario Health Study data is linked at ICES already. Uh, the genomic, so, and so once there is genetic data uh, more.